is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. I am just out here with Wilman and Shalkow once again in the Model K2. Going around the KSC uh, trying to scrounge up the remaining science that I had to leave behind after this mission got aborted last episode due to a broken wheel. And, uh, you know, this is much the same sort of mission as you've seen before. So why don't I use this time to talk about what's coming up in this episode. Uh, in this episode, we will be revisiting some of our ships that are on their way to Mimish. I also have a remote tech contract to uh, point a dish at every planet uh, from a single satellite. So I'm going to use that to... This should be the final generation of communication satellites. But the thing I'm the most excited about is my Mark III space shuttle, the uh, Columbia II, that is going to be flying on its inaugural mission a little bit later in this episode. But in the meantime, Wilman and Shellcow had little difficulty scrounging around uh, the KSC, getting the last bits of the science that was available there. And then it was time warping to the completion of the Otter AS that you saw well, kind of do some acrobatics towards the end of the last episode. I want to try that mission again and wait, what? I have two notifications here. Okay, that's for the completion of the Otter 4AS. That makes sense. Contract complete? Wait a second. This is the uh, contract I was just talking about to point a dish at every planet. 855. Thousand curb bucks I got for that, and quite a bit of reputation too. That makes no sense. Why did that suddenly get awarded? Let's see if we can dial up the contract here using. Uh, con yep, there it is. It's in green, and according to this, it was completed by Interplanetary Relay Two, which is in the right orbit. It's in a geostationary orbit, but it certainly doesn't have enough antennas. It doesn't have an antenna that can point past Duna. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I do have these uh, this satellite coming up. You'll be seeing it later on in the episode. In fact, I have two. It has a sister uh, satellite that you will also be seeing probably in a future episode. But, oh well, whatever. <laughs> I guess I get the money a little bit early. So let's join the Otter 4AS with its balance issues now resolved, flying a nice steady course on its way once again to the Badlands. This is a mission that I tried to do last episode, ended up being forced to abort, and it is loaded down with the surface science pack equipment, and I'm on my way to the Badlands because that's the biome on which I have collected the least amount of science, and we're going to collect as much science as we can. But of course, first of all, Wilman has to set up the experiments, and unfortunately, that crash was actually a portent of things to come. Yeah, I don't know if uh, what's going on here, or if it's just something about the Badlands that doesn't like me. But, uh, yeah. And so I've just got a bit of a quick montage of various explosions, and these are all surface science parts. Uh, with a lot of reverts in between. And I was trying just putting them down rather than attaching them to the ground. I was trying different locations. Some do seem more susceptible to this than others. <laughs> but obviously, eventually I had enough. Um, and what I ended up deciding to do, and what eventually worked, was like, why uh, stop sticking them to the ground? They stick to the uh, Model K2, my little science buggy, fairly well. So let's try building this on the actual wing surface of the of the plane. And that seemed to work pretty good. And uh, I thought, well, before uh, Shell Cal got in there and started doing the science, uh, why don't I give this golf club a try? Now, somebody uh, commented in a previous video that uh, in order to collect the science from the golf club, what you need to do is put it down on the ground first. Okay, so we'll equip it, and then we'll right click on the club, four, there we go, point three science once again, collect that, 
Now I'd like to get the science out of the club. So I guess I got to unequip it to put it down. So unequip. And then we'll just drag it down to the ground here and uh, let it go. Yeah, I guess that was kind of entirely predictable, wasn't it? Oh, Shell Cow, stop running into wheels already. Oh, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Ninja Shell Cow. Oh, that was impressive. Oh, I got to get out of here. This place is entirely too glitchy. So Shell Cow is just going to go up here and collect the science. And then uh, Wilman will go and dismantle all of this kind of stuff because we do have some nearby highlands. So I thought I would just do a quick little hop over to the nearby highlands, set this stuff up again and collect the same thing from uh, from the highlands biome. But, uh, well, things again didn't quite go as planned. Oh, oh, what's going on now? Oh, that junction point's going crazy. It was right when I linked to it, when Wilman linked to it. I guess he didn't like the link going through the wing and... Oh, wait, Shell Cow's in the plane. That's right, because I just flew over here. I haven't gotten Shell Cow out yet. <laughs> and this plane doesn't look too stable. Let's get Shell Cow out of here. Transfer crew. Oh, come on. Oh, oh, this is used. Maybe we can just stop this. Yeah, get back to Wilman. Um, if Wilman can unlink that, or just even just sort of pull the part off, that'll do it. So get in there, Wilman. Get you under that wing again. I thought I was being so clever building everything from under the wing so he wouldn't have to climb up on top. But I think that strategy came in came around and bit me in the behind. Okay, right click on it or grab it and pull it off. I don't care. Oh, oh gosh. This, I think, oh, this is hopeless. <laughs> this isn't going to work. Um, And I mean, this is just the Highlands. There are Highlands that aren't that far away from the KSC. So what I ended up doing after not too long a period of time is just gave up on this I just recovered Wilman then recovered the plane and uh, I mean let's face it the model K2 can get to the Highlands probably with less effort than this so here we are with the model K2 almost at the Highlands we are actually currently in the grasslands you can take a look there at our mini map this little mini map coming from Scansat's just great for mapping out the biomes and you can see just past the highlands I'm not too far away either from the mountains. Yeah, I'm gonna keep going with this and uh, Of course I did collect science in the grasslands I also took advantage of the KSC itself being in the shore so collected science from the shore so I could knock off quite a bit of this surface science pack stuff just from around the KSC itself so what that just leaves me with is the tundra and the poles to go to but before we get to the tundras and the poles well I thought after the Otter 4AS was ready to go again the next day that maybe I would go a little bit closer to home Yeah, because other than the tundra and the ice caps the other biome I still have left is the desert and there is a very convenient patch of desert just on the opposite the west coast continent that the KSC is on just on the other side of the mountain range that should be easy to get to and given how my adventures in the Badlands with this vehicle uh, let's I, I think maybe doing something simple might be in order here and I should mention as well that we got uh, you know I've been focusing so much on Shell Cal and Wilman our scientists and our engineer that uh, I should be drawing some attention to our brave pilots we have Stala with us didn't say that right, really, did I? Stella! She is our pilot along with the this time, and in the mission before with the Otter 4AS, it was Gilly. So, uh, yeah, shout out to our brave pilots. But anyway, going to the desert, uneventful, and setting up the equipment, no problem this time. Yeah, the equipment went down on the surface of the desert without any issues. Shelka was able to get it all up and uh, collect that science. I did try the golf club once again with, well, you can see much the same results. But uh, you know what? 
uh, I'm, I'm fine. I don't care about the golf club. Whatever. If it's going to be that way, it's going to be that way. Uh, I didn't even bother packing up the equipment. <laughs> We're gonna let we're gonna let the, the lesser people come back and go collect the equipment. I'm just gonna fly on out of here and get these folks back home because I'm spending way too much time doing this piddly science stuff. Whoa! What the heck is exploding? What was that? Okay, the plane. I still got my landing gear. It wasn't that? The plane itself actually looks fine. I don't see anything that came off the plane. The explosions looked ahead of me for some reason. I mean, clearly, given the history here, I would explain I would suspect the surface science pack stuff. I don't know why the explosions were ahead of me though. The plane seems okay. And we'll just fly our way back to the Kerbal Space Center. Okay, we got a notification here. What's this say? SCP power station debris exploded. Yep, that's a surface science pack part. Ah. Oh well, I got the science out of it, and we're on our way back. So I don't really care. You know what? And we've been spending way too much time in and around the surface of Kerbin. It's time to get ourselves a little bit further away from home. This is the Korion 1, just about to enter in to Minmus' sphere of influence. Ooh, I got a smidge of gravity science that I can collect over Kerbin's water. I might as well get that while the opportunity presents itself. Let's focus in here. And there, let's see, what do we got? 1.6 science. Oh, well, whatever. It's there. And, uh... We'll send out McNand and we'll collect this science here. Oh wait, let's um just minimize our X science window a little bit so it's a little bit out of the way because I do have something to show you with McNan. Let's focus in a little bit on his helmet. And you can see there he's got a little, well not too little, a number six because he is my sixth scientists that I've acquired with his name on the back, McNan. Hopefully that will help me out <laughs> keeping my Kerbal straight. Unfortunately, the facial textures are still a little bit messed up. But yeah, I like that. Actually, and I did do this uh, my first, I don't know, maybe about a dozen episodes of this series. Uh, I had numbers on the helmets of my Kerbals. And then I started getting concerned about... Uh, memory because each of these helmet textures now is a separate texture and I was worried I was loading too many textures and that was going to interfere with uh, with the RAM on the computer so um, I, I ended up taking them out and then I don't know just a, so I, KSP's been 64 bit now for quite some time it just occurred to me man I could just put these right back so uh, yeah we put them back I think it looks pretty good Anyway, uh, why don't we just cut on ahead into being into Minmus's sphere of influence, and I'm just using um, the X science to see what science I can collect, and using ScanSat to see what biomes I will be going over in high science as we move towards doing our capture burn. And I can see here that I'm still missing quite a number of high gravity scans. Unfortunately, the only one that I'm going to be crossing before I get to periapsis to do my capture burn will be the poles. So, of course, I did make sure to get that. And then we did our capture just underneath the south pole. And then I left my apoapsis nice and high because, of course, we do have to make an inclination change in order to rendezvous with Minmis Station. And while I'm setting up the maneuver to make that inclination stage change, <laughs> I'll draw attention here to the Kegel 6. This is a new lander, and it got here just a couple of hours ahead of us. I'm not 100% sure how that happened because it, la it launched after us. In fact, of the three vessels coming here, um, it was the one that launched last, and it's getting here first. <laughs> so go figure on that one. Uh, the other vessel that's coming to Minmus is the Karayan 3, which is about three days behind us. And the reason why that happened, of course, is because... As you saw last episode, it made a bit of a detour around the moon. It was sort of a, 
a kind of a last minute change I decided to make because I wanted to switch my scientists. It's going to bring Carol over to here and Carol's going to do some min miss landings and then we're going to put McNand onto the Corian 3 and the Corian 3 is going to go back to the moon. Actually, this is going to turn out to be quite the experience haul for McNand because this is his first orbit around Minmus, then he's going to orbit and land on the moon. So that's going to be quite a bit of experience for McNand. Um, and you know, I'm, some people might be wondering why I bothered with that just to switch scientists. Well, it's because actually the Corian 3 doesn't have that much to do around the moon and I'm not that much in a hurry to get it back. So I thought this would be just a fun thing to do with it. And well, the reason it doesn't have much to do around the moon, well, because it's because of this mission. So far in this series, every gram of resources that I've used in space, I've had to haul up Kerbin's gravity well from the surface of Kerbin. And that obviously costs a lot of funds. And ideally, I would love to harvest those resources in space. So that's what this is all about. I've had these parts unlocked for a, a reasonable amount of time, and I've always wanted to get to them. But, uh, well, you know, a few episodes ago, I was just finishing off all of those interplanetary missions that I was, well, not finishing off the missions, really just starting them, but I had to hit those interplanetary transfer windows. So with that stuff cleared up, I was able to get into something a little bit more ambitious. And in fact, this got a little bit out of control, to be quite honest. What I want to do is I want to latch on to that B-class asteroid, asteroid Yoy, that's in orbit about the moon, and start harvesting from that. And uh, at, at first, this thing actually it had a HAB module on it, it had life support and docking. I was making a whole station out of this thing, and it just got really kind of out of control. So what I did is I scaled it all back. Other than the expense, of getting it out there, um, I thought, you know, maybe things would be best served if I made this into a prototype. I don't want to use the moon as the main resource gathering place because the moon has a pretty steep gravity well, at least compared to Minmus. That's where I really want to do resource harvesting. So if this works out well, um, then we'll scale this up, take it out to Minmus. Actually, what I really want to do is I still have a contract to put a D class asteroid around Minmus. That's what I really want to make a base of resource harvesting to supply my Kerbin system uh, expeditions. <laughs> so, so that's sort of the eventual plan for this. But until this thing gets out to the moon, there really is not much for the Corian 3 crew to do. So that's why I'm not in a hurry with them. So they can leisurely make their way back to Minmus, leisurely make their way back. By then, hopefully this thing has made its way through the building process with Kerbal construction time and we'll have it had its chance to get out to the moon. So we will rejoin this vessel at some point in a future episode. We'll see it as it tries to perform its mission. But right now, why don't we very briefly get back to the Otter 4AS for a last bit of science scrounging that I'm doing in this episode. It is the wee hours of the morning and we are on our way to the last two biomes we have left to do, the ice caps and the tundra. Unfortunately, once at the ice caps, which is where I went first, uh, my experience at the Badlands just repeated itself with exploding surface science parts uh, so I, I, connecting it to the plane ended up working just fine I was able to collect the science I don't know I was I've never had any issues with the surface science pack before now I hope this isn't a sign of things to come but I guess only the future will tell that as for this particular mission once I collected the science I was done I didn't I wasn't gonna bother taking this apart again and making my way over to the tundra uh, I've spent hours and hours with this scrounging, and it's only the sort of completionist in me that gets me doing this. It really doesn't bring in all that much science. So I just recover these folks where they are, called it a day, and moved on. This is Kerbal Comsat 1, a mission for which I used to have a contract until it mysteriously fulfilled itself. But either way, I still want to launch these things, and again, to remind people of what the contract was and what the mission still is is to have a satellite that has six dish antennas on it one to point at every one of the planets in the Kerbal system and in fact this also has a sister crafty 
Gerbil Comm Sat 2 that uh, is identical to it that will also go up. And both of these are on their way to Keo stationary orbits. The original plan was actually to put both of these two satellites on the same transfer vehicle and set up a nice transfer orbit uh, to, to get these positioned all right, but they just turned out to be too freaking huge, so they each get their own lifter and everything, and that's just the way I went because it was way, way simpler. Um, and what I want to do, I already have three satellites in Keo stationary orbit, so I would like that are all one, equally spaced, so 120 degrees apart, and I would like to place this halfway between two of them. So what I've done is I have selected Keo Comsat 1 as a target, and I'm looking at the intercept angle provided to me by Kerbal Engineer, and I'm waiting for it to get 60 to 60 degrees. And then once it's 60 degrees, I'm going to start my burn, and I'm going to keep burning until my apoapsis gets up to 2,868.78 kilometers. Um, and then that's, that's the altitude for a Keo stationary orbit. And doing it when the intercept angle was at 60 degrees means that I will be 60 degrees behind Keo Comsat 1, which puts me actually 60 degrees ahead of Keo Comsat 3, which is halfway between, isn't it? So <laughs> that should work out just fine. And in fact, here we are up at Apoapsis performing our circularization burn. And all we are doing is waiting until our period, our orbital period, gets up to six hours. And actually, to be honest, uh, six hours does not make a Keo stationary orbit anymore. It used to, a number of uh, versions of Kerbal Space Program ago, ago, when six hours was the length of the Kerbin sidereal day, the, the amount of time it takes Kerbin to rotate relative to the stars, which is what you want if you want to stay over the same position on Kerbin's surface. Uh, right now, though, the six hours is the Kerbin solar day. The Kerbin sidereal day is actually five hours, 59 minutes, and 9.4 seconds. And yes, I did look that up. <laughs> and uh, so what I really, if I want a Keo stationary orbit, I really should have that as my orbital period. But it'll work just as well just the other way. And I already have these other three satellites up there. I want them all to be in the same orbit. It'll look a little messier if I actually put this in a slightly different orbit. So there it is. It's, it's, it's going into, air quotes, Keo stationary orbit. Anyway, now comes my favorite part. No, not the Infernal Robotics. It's this part right here. <laughs> yes, there we go. Six dish antennas. Actually, there are a total of eight dish antennas plus the omnidirectional communitron on this thing. The uh, I got these, these three at the top are for the inner planets of Moho, Eve, and Duna. Then the Three larger ones are for Drez and Jewel and Elu. And then I also have two smaller ones you can't see here that are just for communicating in around the Kerbin system. Specifically, I don't quite trust that communitron to have the range to reach out here. So uh, the smaller dish antennas are actually communicating with Keocomsat 3 and Keocomsat 1 so that all my Keocomsats are communicating with each other. But anyway, with that done, let's do a quick trip back to Minmus, uh, just really to show you the Karayan 1 here, closing in on Minmus Station, and having had collected all of that high altitude gravity science, actually the one blank one at the bottom is actually near space science over the highlands. Yeah, the fun of Search features don't quite get exactly what you want sometimes. So so that's great. And I was just in the process of getting myself to Minmus Station. I didn't do any detours to do any of that. So I was pretty, pretty happy with that little science haul. And I just wanted to show you as well them getting to Minmus Station. Note that the Kegel 6 is already there waiting for them. And that thing is all fueled up and ready to go down to the surface of Minmus. But... Again, going to put that on hold until the Karayan 3 gets here. You'll be seeing that next episode. We'll do our crew flip, and then we'll get these folks back down to Minmus. But right now, well, I want to get on to the main event.
This is the Columbia 2 by Mark III Space Shuttle. And aboard, we have ourselves, well, we have almost everybody that was on the surface. We got Stala, we got Gilly, we got Wilman, and we have Shell Cal. Uh, that actually leaves only Brooke on the surface right now. I think I need to work on investing in some more Kerbals. You know, I think I'll just turn the RCS off. It's actually pretty well balanced. You can tell, if you take a look at the pitch over here, that um, right now it's pretty evenly balanced. So we'll just uh, leave the RCS off. I like to use RCS to to help counter the sort of uh, asymmetry of this thing. But of course, as that main booster starts to drain fuel, it's losing mass and the pitch has to start working harder and harder. So I'll, I've just put the RCS back on. Um, I could tweak down that main engine. That is an option. Uh, yeah, with my space shuttles, you might recall from my Mark II space shuttle that uh, I actually like to put an engine on the bottom of that external fuel tank to make it more of a main booster. But we're about to lose the SRBs here. That should help with balance. There they go. And yeah, the balance has come back towards the middle. But I think what I'll do is I'm just going to select this main engine here. And we'll just sort of tweak it down. And I'm just going to keep an eye on the pitch indicator. And uh, the pitch indicator is a pretty good indication of how hard it is working to keep itself on track, for the most part, on that prograde vector. I don't want to let my thrust drop too low, so I am watching my thrust to weight ratio at the same time. I don't want that to drop really much below 2. Because, uh, yeah, I do want to get myself into orbit in a reasonably efficient way. But keeping the uh, that engine menu off to the side and just tweaking down the engine, I, I find that a simpler thing to do than to start getting into angling the engines on the orbiter and all that kind of stuff, which is the kind of thing the real space shuttle did, of course. But this works very well as well. And of course, we're just going to ride this up until we get to Apoapsis. And our target, by the way, is Kerbin Station. This is in the process of delivering up a new docking hub and some habitation and some storage and actually quite a lot of stuff as you'll be seeing in just a little bit. And the four Kerbals on here, they are all on here with purpose. This is, uh, nobody's here just for the ride. You can see that there's a fairly long extension on that main booster. And that's because at the end of that, there are some burner engines to help with uh, attitude control. And oh, we are coming to main engine cutoff. There we go. And now I can turn the RCS off. Uh, yeah, so and getting those burner engines way forward helps with attitude control and specifically controlling pitch. That's really the only thing that is an issue. You know, why don't we uh, roll this thing so it's right side up so you can get a bit of a better look at it. There we go. This thing is actually pretty beastly compared to my Columbia 1 uh, Mark II parts. Besides just having the bigger payload, this thing has a delta V of almost a kilometer a second once we lose the main booster. We'll take a look here at the back end. We have five engines, three of the swivel engines, and two of these radial thud engines. That gives it a thrust to weight ratio of about 1.9, which is crazy <laughs> for orbital maneuvering. It was certainly helpful when taking off, though. And that's with a pretty hefty payload. This thing's got a full cargo bay right now. And in fact, why don't we just cut ahead to after our circularization and getting rid of the main booster and take a look at what our cargo is. Um, there it is. This is our new docking node for Kerbin Station. And so we're going to need to perform our rendezvous and connect this to Kerbin Station. But I think that's going to have to be for next episode. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time. Thank <laughs> you.